with during my career, and, uh, but I really like a lot of the uh, problems that are being studied in here, approximation uh, by various means and rational interpolation amongst other things. Um, I'll explain that picture later. I should, my editor gets really annoyed at me unless I mention my book at every talk, so here we go. But just to mention that the, the book might actually be of interest to you, I make a connection to uh, the Cauchy interpolation problem which was uh, just mentioned uh, in the last talk. Uh, so problem 8.42 talks about a way to do that in very centric form for the univariate uh, thing that based on some uh, work by Pachon and Pedro Gonet and other people. So there's, there's my sales pitch for, for the uh, uh, audience. And it's about as good as it gets. By the way, the, the paperback version, which you get through your library, costs Springer money to make because it only costs 25 units of the local currency and it's so big that, that it costs them. One single pricing is convenient for a bunch of reasons, but maybe they wouldn't be so happy to advertise the, for me to advertise the talk if, if they realize that it costs them money to get a copy. Anyway. Um, so I think the end result is what Rob was trying to say, if you don't like Springer, buy Springer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'm going to be running the talk, uh, oh actually I should leave that at least as background um, while we're while we're going, um, I'm going to the talk is going to be I'm going to be using the blackboard and I'm going to be using the document camera. And one of the reasons to use a blackboard is to slow the speaker down. Uh, another reason is to encourage some activity uh, participation on the part of the audience. So I figured I would I would start with exactly that. Um, I'd ask people, how many people here have taught a course involving the gamma function where you've actually done at least part of one lecture on the gamma function in the last two years? One? Okay. How many within the last 10 years have done that? Two? Okay. Okay. Now, how many of you have taken a course in special functions or something else where there was a significant unit on the gamma function? Me? Yeah, okay. A few more. And, but everybody, of course, has had some exposure to the gamma function from, from time to time. So maybe you remember some things. What, could, could, give me some facts that you remember about the gamma function. Anybody? X gamma X. X, so the recurrence relation? Yeah, so gamma of uh, X plus 1 is X gamma X. Another fact? Ah, okay. Very few people remember that there is a multiplication formula. I don't remember off the top of my head what the multiplication formula is. Um, but I actually have it handy. So, <laughs> so I can actually look it up. But that's not one that, I, that is carried on the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I should have asked how many people have written about the gamma function. And there would be at least one, one person there. So the duplication formula... Uh, there we go. The Sterling formula was the one that, that I was hoping for. Um, So the Euler's the formula, the, the, the reflex. So gamma of z, gamma of 1 minus z is pi over sine by pi z. Is that the one you wanted? The, oh, aha, okay. That one, that was Euler's original definition. And now we'll just do that for z factorial. Uh, it's the definition. m factorial m plus 1 to the z divided by, and I'm going to write, uh, uh, I'll write it out. So there's Euler's definition of, of the factorial function. Another one? 
I'm running out of space here, but... Oh, by the way, Matteo, can you read that blackboard from all the... Okay, good. The black actually works. So, another formula for the gamma function, another definition? Just the integral. The integral definition. So that one only works for a real part of z bigger than zero, and then you use the reflection formula to, to guarantee. Sure. Factorial, uh, the, factorial, the definition of factorial contains the factorial in the definition. That's true. <laughs> and so here I've got the, the English convention, the letter z means a complex number, and uh, any letter starting i through n is a Fortran convention, so that means it's an integer. So we presume that we have defined an integer factorial, and from that, we can define uh, a non-integer factor. But it's, it's interesting. I'm sorry? Division formula. I don't know a division formula. Gamma of z plus a divided by gamma of z. Ah, oh, uh, asymptotically x to the power a. Okay. So here's, here's a bunch of these gamma facts. That I, and so there's one here that I didn't write down on the on the list, which is the uh, gamma thing, and another one I wrote here that I want to talk about a little bit. So there's the Stirling formula associated with the name of Stirling, and here's another variation of it in the, the logarithmic form. And the interesting bit here is you've got a one over twelve z, but no one over z squared term. You only have odd powers in the logarithmic term. Most people don't make a distinction between the, the two things. Okay, that's fine. Uh, history. So you guys have all been talking about modern things from, from 1795, pronies. Ah, of course, there's lots more, which we will need. So the bibliography of the gamma function at millandmerkel.com has 986 entries in it. The American Mathematical Monthly has published more than 50 papers on the gamma function, on Sterling's formula, since uh, about 1940. They, they started in uh, 1894, uh, but the first Sterling paper was on a different Sterling thing, and that was in 1904. So there's, been, there's a ton of material on the gamma function out there. You just, we're sort of drowning in it. And the history is, is huge. So as I say, we, I'm, I'm taking you back to older material than Prony. 1730 is both Euler for this definition and the Stirling formula. I waved my hand at the Stirling formula, but I will come back to that. Since then, uh, millions. The definition of the derivative, is, that, is, it, is it the same as the, the differentiating under the integral sign? Yes. Uh, yes, it works. Yeah. Yes, it does work, uh, provided you're in the right half side. The, the convergence is wonderful for that integral provided the real part of z is bigger than zero. Um, there's a lot of famous names associated with gamma. So almost every one of the 19th century mathematicians did something with the gamma function, which is really kind of cool. Um, that's gonna, let's see if this works now. Uh, move that over a little bit. We're going to take aim at the Stirling formula. And I want to do that by elementary quadrature. So that Stirling formula is kind of a bizarre thing. You start with a factorial and you wind up with, well, you know, exponentials and powers of powers. Where do they come from? What's, what's going on there? And one way to do that is start with the trapezoidal rule for the logarithm. So the logarithm is a concave function. And so the trapezoidal rule approximations to the logarithm integral are going to give you lower bounds. So we can say that, uh, suppose that's uh, a j and j plus 1. We can say pretty much immediately that, uh, well, the trapezoidal rule estimate for that uh, area, that's log t, um, that says one half of log j 
plus log of j plus 1 is strictly less than the integral from j to j plus 1 of log t. Now, I think probably we need to do that. Okay, well, we can do this integral, log t dt. And so that gives us a, uh, an upper bound on the sum of, well, it's not a very useful upper bound because we've only got two things in there. But let's um, instead look at uh, one half log m plus the sum from j equals uh, m plus 1 to n minus 1 log j plus 1 half log n. So I'm going to take a whole bunch of these. And as usual, the trapezoidal rule, on the inner ones, you double up. So I get a nice sum with no 1 halves here. And this is going to be strictly less than the integral from m to n of log t dt, which is n log n minus n minus m log m plus m. Just first year calculus exercise to do the logarithm. Everybody remembers, oh yeah, we have to teach that when we go back. Right, OK. Some of you have to teach it when you get back. Lucky you. Um, Great. Still, still no factorial. I don't see a factorial here. But we're going to get a factorial out of the sum of the logarithms because that's going to be, when you combine them all, it's going to be the log of the product. I want to start not at 1 here. I want to start at m because I'm going to do something a little different than, uh, than that formula. But now that I've got this formula, I'm going to add to both sides. I'm going to add. Um, the sum from j equals 1 to m minus 1 of log j plus 1 half log m plus 1 half log n. And that will turn all this thing into just the sum uh, uh, of log j's. But I have to add it. I have to add exactly the same thing on, the, on that side. It's getting a bit messy. Not that messy. Let's move to the document camera. So I said there were 50 papers in the monthly that did Stirling's method, or that did gamma function. About 10 of them used trapezoidal rule for, <laughs> for Stirling's uh, formula. So here's what I just did there. We get this less than or equal to this. I require that m be less than n because otherwise the sense of the inequality is reversed. Right? If I'm integrating backwards, it's the wrong way around. So we add this stuff to both sides. We get the sum of the logarithms. It's less than n log n minus m log m plus m uh, plus all this stuff. The n's appear here. So pointing at the screen is an acceptable thing. This is a great thing. I really like that. Uh, I do want to warn people about green lasers. Green lasers are just energetic enough to damage people's eyes. People's eyes have been hit by enthusiastic speakers wandering around. Um, where, did my, uh, where did my pointer go? There are other pointers. So here's a deadly pointer. There's a <laughs> log of, we get a log of n factorial by adding up those logarithms on there. And if we combine all the terms that contain m, there's another one hiding over there, uh, and we just combine them all into a logarithm of d sub m. So we get the log of n factorial is less than the something that depends on m plus n plus 1 half times log n minus n. And there's the source of, uh, oh, wait, I've got uh, uh, z minus half. Anyway, we'll, we'll uh, We'll see if it, that this one half uh, come up properly. We've got n factorial here and gamma function here, so there may be uh, errors in that stuff. Um, there's a huge long-running argument over the shift. For, so gamma of z is n, z minus 1 factorial. We've got two notations for the same function. I mean, one of them is shifted by 1. And reading the footnotes in the comments is just hilarious. Uh, Jeffries and Jeffries say that this, is, this shift by 1 is a minor but continual nuisance. 
So we'll just leave it at that for the minor continual, continual nuisance. So here we have n factorial is less than this number dm times n to the n plus 1 half times e to the minus n. And dm we have to compute with taking factorials of m. So this only makes sense if m is small. So we might use 10 factorial to compute 100 factorial, or we might use 100 factorial to compute 1,000 factorial or a, or a million factorial. In fact, I worked out what uh, d100 is. So I worked out what that constant was for 100 factorial. And it's about 2.50. We don't need any deep analysis to get this particular thing. So I said to myself, 10 papers in the monthly using trapezoidal rule. Nobody, not one person, used the midpoint rule. Okay, well, we go back to this diagram over here. And very faintly, in pink, I have the line uh, for the midpoint. So the midpoint comes up, touches there. It's not obvious. It was not obvious to me until I read it, it actually in a first-year calculus textbook by Stuart that the midpoint rule gives an upper bound for this function. Everybody who knows the error formula for Lagrange remainder goes, oh yeah, second derivative is negative, of course, and this is, yeah, of course it is. But you can see it geometrically. So you start with the, the midpoint rule this way, and you say, okay, let's just tilt it. Let's just tilt it until it's tangent. And we start with equal distances here, and we move things, I don't know, I can't see my arms whether they're really straight, okay. <laughs> um, okay, good. Um, tilt it this way, obviously the angle here was the angle there. Um, and there's two right angles there. Oh, we have two angles, therefore three angles the same. The triangles are congruent. Oh, so if I drew another, how did I do with the chalk? There we go. If I drew another line here that was just tangent, then this area here is exactly the same as that area there. And so now I'm above the curve. So the midpoint rule gives an upper bound. Well, I like that. So now I try to do exactly the same kind of thing, only starting from the midpoint rule. And We want to be a little bit careful with this. Uh, the only problem with putting down your uh, hand of glory onto this wonderful tablecloth is he tends to disappear into the uh, thing there. So for convenience, I want to do integrals uh, j minus a half to j plus a half so that the midpoint rule gives me a log j. All right, so if I do that, then I have to be a little bit careful about where I start. So I start at k plus 1 half to make the formulas a little bit nicer later. But again, k has to be less than n, strictly less than n. Otherwise, this stuff doesn't give me any sensible results. And we break that up in, as a sum of integrals. And on each of the integrals, we use the, the rule up above. And so the integral from k plus 1 half to n plus 1 half is less than the sum from j equals k plus 1 up to n of log j. And now, it's slightly easier. I just add log j, sum of log j to both sides. But I get exactly the same kind of thing. I get uh, uh, the sum of j equals 1 to k of log j plus the integral is less than the sum from j equals 1 to n of log j, which is log of n factorial. OK, so that gives me exactly the same kind of thing. If I define log of ck to be this collection of things that involves k but not n, that's the same thing as saying ck is k factorial times e to the k plus a half over k plus a half raised to the power of k plus one half. And I get the inequality running the other way. I get ck times uh, a certain function, well, let's write, write it down here, ck times n plus a half times n raised to the n plus a half times e to the minus n plus a half is less than n factorial is less than dm times n to the n plus one half times e to the minus n. I'm really pleased about that. Uh, a 
completely elementary treatment. The C100 is 2.5055, not too different from 2.5087, which was from the previous one, slightly bigger. I went to John Borwin. So this is, arose out of work with John Borwin and I. We were going to write a, a paper for the monthly together. Um, I've now finished that paper, finished the first draft of that paper, and I submitted it Thursday. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a bit. Anyway, I said to John, this is new. It's, I, I've never, ever, ever seen. Look, we've got an n plus a half raised to the n plus a half. That's new. It's got to be new. And John, not in a very unkind way, but in a very sharp way, said, you know, that's really hard <laughs> to say that something is new. Okay, but I've never seen it. I've read a lot of this stuff now, and I've never seen it. Well, 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 it isn't new. Mm, we'll come back to the it isn't new. Actually, we'll do the it isn't new now. We'll do the it, it isn't new right now. And I really wanted to write this stuff down on a blackboard. So I'm going to actually write this stuff down on a blackboard. And it's actually really cool. So if we consult a particular old um, uh, reference, we get a few terms. Oops, pardon me, I want to write that. Uh, he has a few terms of this series, the added to half the logarithm of the circumference of the circle whose radius is 1, gives the sum of the logarithms of 1 up to n, i.e. the logarithm of n factorial. What was meant here, L comma Z, is the common logarithm, log base 10, and this number A is 1 over the natural log of 10. So it's th that A that is occurring there is just to convert the formula into common logs. And if this one's a common log and you multiply everything else by the right thing, then that's fine. So A is 1 over log 10, and L comma Z is that. So bets, bets as to when this was. Where, who did this formula? Anybody? So in one of the later monthly references, not in JSTOR yet, the monthly waits five years before putting their papers in JSTOR. So you go into the library and consult the actual things. I found another one that referenced... Burnside, as a paper by Burnside in 1917 that had the n plus a half raised to the n plus a half. That's not Burnside. That's Sterling, 1730. Oh, there's a Z here. Is this the same Z as that I've been using? No. Z is n plus a half. In order to compute log n factorial, Sterling first perturbed by one half. And he got the midpoint formula. The formula that Sterling invented has n plus a half to the n plus a half e to the minus n plus a half in it. CK doesn't have CK. He says added to one half the logarithm of the circumference of a circle whose radius is 1. Oh, that's the logarithm of the square root of 2 pi. Oh. <laughs> what, but, but where's this 2 pi coming in here? Uh, let's skip the extra accuracy of, of midpoint rule. Uh, those inequalities make sense only if k is much smaller than n and m is much smaller than n because then you can't use them computationally. But what happens if you put them up to k equals n or m equals n? You get exact equality. This says that n factorial equals n factorial. <laughs> okay, I kind of knew that. But if you go bigger, then the sense of the inequality reverses because now we're integrating past something, so the sense of the inequality changes. And what happens is the CKs go to root 2 pi and the DKs 
go to root 2 pi. So the CKs are continually increasing until you hit exact equality with the right, and then you keep going, you, it's now wrong, but now it's converging to square root of 2 pi. The DKs, the uh, DMs, go get exact equality when it's equal to n factorial, and then go down and it converges to root 2 pi. So the sense of the inequality in the limiting sense reverses. So root 2 pi times n plus a half to the n plus about a half minus times e to the minus n plus a half is bigger than n factorial, and root 2 pi n to the n plus a half e to the minus n is less than n factorial. Oh, I've got a z to the z minus a half here. Oh, oh yeah, right, gamma z is z minus 1 factorial. <coughs> I found that really interesting, that, that it was, Sterling actually did this. And it, this formula that everybody knows as Sterling's formula is due to Dimov. A little bit later. So we were talking earlier about credit for things. This gets really funny. Uh, do I have it here? I do. Here is a paper by Spouge in 1994. Uh, I don't know, can you really see that? Okay, it says the relative error, the next theorem is a curiosity. The relative error in the approximation z factorial is approximately z plus a half to the z plus a half divided by e times root 2 pi is less than blah. Since this is true, the equation 13 is not only simpler than Sterling's formula, it's twice as accurate. <laughs> it is Sterling's formula. <laughs> so, but there's no possibility, no possibility at all of changing the way the world views this formula. That's going to be Sterling's formula forever, or maybe the logarithmic version of it. There's no hope of changing an installed database of thousands of of papers and books and things on that. It gets funnier. There's some new work by uh, Peter Lushny and Wei Peng Wang and other people who've got all kinds of different formulas for these things. They're starting to call the exponentiated version of this one the De Moivre formula. <laughs> I love that. So it's true that this, these kinds of things does happen. People get the wrong names. So Newton invented Euler's method, actually invented symplectic Euler, and Euler invented Newton's method. So I think that's a really nice trade. Um, the sense of the inequalities swaps when you go to the limiting sense, so maybe the names should swap too. It's, it's okay by me. I'm perfectly happy with that. All right, so that was the first part of what I wanted to tell you about was just some very elementary results about approximating the gamma function by very elementary means. Of course, you, you want more terms, you want more accuracy than this provides, and the asymptotic nature of the, the series is, as is well known. This is an asymptotic series as well, and these coefficients are known in terms of Bernoulli numbers, and the coefficients of the logarithmic version of uh, I, I want to say Sterling's formula due to Dumov, and then I can say Sterling's Dumov formula due to Sterling. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the logarithmic version of this is also done in terms of Bernoulli numbers. And in fact, they're proportional. This one is negative a half times the first term. This one is negative seven eighths times the term of this one. The next one is negative 15 sixteenths. And then there's 31, 30 seconds. So you, you get the idea. They're just power, pure powers of two, um, different from that. So great. We now have a nice collection of asymptotics for for uh, Sterling's like by Sterling for the gamma function. But I wanted to talk to you about the inverse gamma function. And one of the things that came up in this review that uh, John and I were doing was gaps, gaps in the literature. So you read 50 papers from the monthly and you read another 50 papers from various places and you go in and consult a whole bunch of textbooks. Eventually, you're putting puzzle pieces together, you see, wait, there are no pieces of the puzzle here. And one of the things that was really missing from the monthly treatment was the theory of the inverse gamma function. Had anybody here ever seen a paper on the inverse gamma function? 
But I bet sometimes you've wanted to solve when is this term in a, in a series small, smaller than epsilon. And you've wanted to be able to solve an equation that involved n factorial. So it's not so far-fetched that you might actually want to think about the inverse gamma function. Well, the real inverse gamma function is very easy to think about. So if we draw a picture of the gamma function, where's my wonderful, I lost him again. The hand of glory keeps disappearing. Um, it'll come back. Aha! <laughs> Pointing at my heels. So the uh, psi function, of course, is zero everywhere we have uh, a minima of uh, a minimum of the gamma function, and those will translate into branch points, second order branch points for the inverse gamma function. So it's very straightforward to draw uh, the inverse gamma function in maple parametric plots. You just swap the x and y, and away, away you go. Uh, this is kind of interesting, and I'm not going to talk about the complex inverse gamma function much, except maybe at the end, but it'd be, it'd be nice to have, we have an asymptotic formula for this, maybe we can find an asymptotic formula for the inverse function. Maybe we can find asymptotic formulas for these. And of course, uh, there are well-known series, Laurent series, for the uh, gamma function about each of the poles. So if you ask Maple for the series of gamma z about zero, it says, oh sure, and it gives you this wonderful series. Inverting Laurent series, can Maple do that? Yes. So we might talk about that later, but let's talk about the big branch here, the one, the one where the asymptotic Stirling formula is the one that's coming in. Let's try and in, invert that. We're going, go, we're going to go back to the chalk. Uh, So we have, uh, we want to find y such that gamma of y equals x. That's the problem that we're setting ourselves now. Okay, well, I know asymptotically that gamma of y is going to be asymptotic to, uh, let's make the logarithmic term. Let's take the logarithmic version. And log of gamma of y is going to be uh, uh, log of root 2 pi plus uh, y minus a half log y minus a half minus y minus a half. So I'm not going to take any higher order terms, just those ones. Now, is that really the same formula as I had before. I had n plus a half here. Oh yeah, that blasted shift by one. <laughs> That's the gamma function. This is factorial. So log of gamma really is log root 2 pi plus y minus a half log y minus a half minus y minus a half. If this were Stirling's formula by de Moivre, that one half is not there and that one half is not there. And it turns out that because of that, this one is easier to invert. So I didn't just do this because it's entertaining. I actually get a, a useful inversion out of this. So just to clean this up a little bit, let's put uh, u equal to y minus a half and v equal to log of x over root 2 pi. So this equation then becomes u log u minus u is equal to v. And I want to solve that equation for v. Cover your ears, George. <laughs> I, la, I, la, I, la, I, la, I, la, I, la, 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 la. W function. <laughs> you are exactly right. So that's, that's the same as u. Oh, no, that's one of, the, that, one of the bad things about chalk is when you drop them, they break. Um, Another one of the bad things about chalkboards is the tendency to use the bottom half and you bend over. And in a flat classroom like this, forget it. So I shall come over here. I probably, third bad thing is you always take the erasers over to the side that you're not on. <laughs> 
So that's uh, u times log u minus 1 equals v. Uh, that's u log u over e equals v. My students really don't like the fact that, that when I write an e, it looks like an l. But if I write an l the ordinary way, it looks too much like a 1. So you take your pick and you have your choice. That's e, that's l. Okay. Um, so I'm going to divide both sides by e. And now I'm going to say, ah, log of u over e times u over e equals v over e. That's log of u over e times e to the log of u over e equals, so I know how to solve the equations like that. You solve them with lambda w. So therefore, log of u over e is uh, Lambert W, any branch of V over E. Has anybody in the room not heard of the Lambert W function? 20 years ago today, that would not have been true. So I'm pleased. Um, I don't like log of U. I want U. I don't want this. I need to take exponentials. Okay, well, luckily with... Uh, I don't need U anymore. So u over e is the exponential of wk of v over e, which is v over e divided by wk of v over e. Because wk of anything times e to the wk of anything is the anything. So u over e is v over e divided by wk. So at long last, u equals v over WK of V over E. And U was Y minus a half, so Y is going to be one half plus uh, V over W of V over E. Put. So this just does exactly that what we what we just did, but it is important that we use the Stirling's original formula. Stirling's formula by Stirling. No, the Demover formula by Stirling. <laughs> I'm going to be amused about that for decades. Uh, so here is our final little formula. All right. This approximately inverts gamma of y equals x. How good is it? That formula is valid only for large x, x bigger than 1. <laughs> it's ridiculous how well that formula inverts. This is using the, the principal branch of Lambert W comes down, and you can just barely see little dots. The difference is about 4% for x being just a, a little bit less than 1, about 0.922. So for, for large values of 0.9, we get a good approximation. What's astounding to me is that I can use the other real branch of Lambert W, W minus 1, and it'll even turn the corner. I'm using a formula that's valid only at infinity, and I've got it so accurately that we can actually turn the corner. When you come up here, it actually goes complex. That's, it, it tries to go up to this one, but it can't. There's no possibility of doing this one. To approximate this branch, we have to invert the Laurent series for the pole, but we can do that. Um, nobody's happy with just one term in an approximation. <laughs> I Relax, I won't make you go through the whole computation here. I won't do it. I've considered doing it on the board, but I decided enough was enough. So we're going to go straight to the docu document camera from now. So the Sterling's original series, there's the general term. We get the 1 minus 2 to the 1 minus 2n times b2n over 2n, 2n minus 1. Uh, Sterling formula by Demov just has these numbers in it and no minus sign and not this factor. But it's uh, odd powers, and I've taken one of them out here, so I've just got even powers there. Now, if we use our initial approximation from this formula that, that we just derived, 
then I want a correction. So I'm going to put u equal this u0 times p, where p is 1 plus some correction terms. u0, that this approximation here, uh, 1 half plus, plus this thing, v is uh, log x over root 2 pi, so that goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. w of that is like log of log of x. So u0 goes to infinity like log x divided by log log x. To infinity, but slowly. So this is going to infinity, but slowly. This is going to infinity slowly, but a little faster than that, and so on. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to think about, to look as an asymptotic series development for this thing. And if you, if you uh, go in and simplify that expression, you can cancel one factor of uh, user, user. And you go ahead and you compute. And the first one you get has got this wonderful factor 24, but it's got something new in here. This is this 1 plus w. So this is getting small as x gets large as well. So it's actually a, quite a good approximation already. Next one, uh, nice big number there. Q cubed, not to worry about. Nice big number, nice big number. Oh, we got horrible numbers occurring on top as well. But we can compute as many terms as we want in this asymptotic development for the inverse gamma function. It is not convergent. In fact, this gets into trouble uh, at the corner right away. So q equals 0 right here. I'll, so the zeroth order term can turn the corner, but even when you add one correction, it can't. So the asymptotics uh, really do hurt you a little bit. Um, those of you who know the online en encyclopedia of integer sequences, the, denom the denominators in that sequence appear. And it connects to Peter Lushny, who I already mentioned, as the person who calls um, the exponentiated version of Sterling's formula, the Dumov formula. Okay. Uh, I really like that series. I'm very happy with that series. Uh, it's just that one branch. So if you want to reverse the uh, Laurent series for the other branches, you can do that. So for instance, at gamma equals, at x equals zero, if you ask Maple for the Laurent series, this is well known. We have the minus gammas and Riemann zeta function stuff occurring in there. and All of these terms are known. If we ask Maple to reverse this, we get one over x minus gamma over x squared plus some ugliness over x cubed plus some more. Well, there's a zeta of three. The zeta of three is occurring there over x. Okay, so we believe that we can get as many terms as we like. I do not know the general term of of these things. I would like to know, but I don't know. At x equals minus n, you can do a series for the forward function, gamma of x, and it begins, the residues are minus 1 to the n over n factorial. Okay. So we, we saw the, the curves getting flatter and flatter, so that's because that factorial, the larger you, you get out there, it's, uh, sorry, for you guys it's going out that way, the flatter that curve gets, and that's why. So 1 over x plus n, and then the next coefficient is the difference between harmonic sum and gamma, so that's sort of log n-ish. And the next terms are getting more complicated. If you reverse it, the series for the inverse function is y equals minus n plus minus 1 to the n over n factorial times x, and then the next one has got an n factorial x squared in it, and the next one has an n factorial x cubed in it, and in fact all of them do. So this series is about as quickly converging a series as I've ever seen. The radius of convergence is still 1, at most 1. In fact, it's always a little bit less than 1 because it's the distance to that, that other branch point, if it converges at all. So I haven't proved the, the convergence of this series or got an actual radius of convergence for it. I'd like to know that as well. But I do know that it's asymptotic as x goes to infinity. So for n even, the series come in like this and this, and we get that series gets both of them. And for uh, if n is odd, then it comes in underneath and above over there. It's kind of fun to do that. This is elementary 
basic function theory for a function that people really hadn't noticed. They said it was in the missing part of the puzzle. I'm really surprised. It's such a basic thing to think about the inverse of a function. Why on earth has nobody... Well, in fact, there are two papers, one in two th 2012, one in 2015, on the inverse gamma function. And that's it, as far as I can find. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to thank the organizers for was for inviting me to this conference, although uh, I'm only you know, tangentially or a little bit overlap with most of the people here. And most of this talk has been completely different, not just in the style of presentation, but in the content from anything that everybody else has done. But I do want to finally make some connection to some, at least in terms of questions, or things that people have here. So um, if you want to compute the forward function, to compute the gamma function forward, it turns out that there are three major collections, maybe four major collections of, of in fact, certainly four, uh, of ways to do it. The first one is just to use the Stirling formula and recurrence. And as far as I know, nobody really uses the, the original Sterling one, except unless they rediscover it. So Spouge rediscovered it. But Lanchos had a, has a beautiful paper from 1964 where he uses a rational approximation to the gamma function and computes really good rational approximations to the gamma function. This is for the complex plane. Uh, Spouge improves that. Uh, oh, Lanchos says that that shift by one is totally void of rationality. I've never seen in a, in, a, in a published paper anybody get so angry about notation before. <laughs> uh, this paper by Schmelzer and Trefethen is wonderful. They look at contour integrals. So to integrate on a, a Bromwich contour around the negative real axis, and they choose the contours in a way to get spectral convergence with the trapezoidal rule or the midpoint rule equivalently. And then they convert that to a rational approximate for the gamma function. Actually, for the they use reciprocal gamma. Um, my question to people here is how should we really compute the inverse gamma function? We've got reasonably good ways to compute the forward function. How should we do this? Rational approximate? Well, we may have to do Puisa stuff where we've got all those corners. I don't know how to handle the corners correctly. I don't know how to handle those really sharp corners, so you might have good approximations going up and then having it to turn the corner is going to be tough. I don't know how to do that. But, oh, uh, INV gamma is a perfectly good text notation. If you've got access to the check, ha check, you can say ha check, and that reminds people of the V for inverse. This is David Jeffrey's general notation for inverse functions. I really like it. Much better than arc because there's no angles involved here, and it's way better than gamma to the minus one because everybody thinks you mean reciprocal gamma. Everybody, because reciprocal gamma is really common in a lot of places. All right, well, the first thing to try is Newton's method. Because of the extreme dynamic range of gamma, you actually want to do the log uh, gamma function, so we, we uh, fire up Newton's method to see what we happen. And near the branch points, this will fail, and by the way, I did not know that until three weeks ago that the asymptotic location of those branch points for gamma is not in the middle, it's closer to the farther end. So the asymptotics of those branch points are minus n plus one over pi inverse tangent pi over log n. So as n goes to infinity, that goes to zero and it's asymptotically close to the pole, which is weird. Anyway, so we try Newton's method. And uh, I'm going to end my talk with how this works. That is uh, basis of attraction for Newton's method for log of gamma of z minus z one, or log of one. Actually, the, ooh, it looks better here. <laughs> um, we have a, a, a Dia de los Muertos version. And there we have it. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Do we have any uh, questions for Rob? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the colors were chosen by a smoothing package. My student, Stephen Thornton, did this one. So it, it, the colors reflect uh, the number of iterations it takes to converge. 
but not so much where it converges to, so they're not coloring to, to converge to different roots. Uh, the this, this central Y, here, let's put it back here. This, this, oh, that's, thank you. <laughs> this uh, central Y is almost the, what we want to call the, the principal branch. Uh, but in fact, we need to have another line in between these two because there are two roots here. And as you can see, they're colored the same, but there are actually two roots that it's converging to. And you can begin to see some weirdo fractal stuff in there, but it's being smoothed out by the algorithm that, that draws the nice picture on this one here. But yes, it's a representation, not anything with tremendous amount of mathematical content. But I kind of like the the colors, and one of my cousins is a dress designer. He owns a company called Dress God, and he's working in uh, uh, London, England, and he's really impressed with this, and so there may be uh, cocktail dresses and uh, tights and things made with these, with these patterns. So next time you're not only selling a book. Next time I'm not only selling a book, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, the, the PDF of the book is free, and it's been pirated, so I, I frankly don't care if people pay money or not, or if you wish to penalize Springer uh -huh, by so buying this one. For yeah, yeah, for future clients, maybe, yeah, yeah. But for, y you will pay through the nose for the cocktail dresses based on this one, yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, e it's easy to find. It's easy to find. I wasn't asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> send an email to my co-author. Nick Filion is very proud of the fact that we've been pirated, so you, he'll send you the link. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Um, One remark. Uh -huh. okay. About the last remark that you made. Okay. My book also was published in 2003. Okay. For the last 13 years, I haven't heard anything from the publisher. Cambridge University Press. <sighs> And the book can be downloaded from a, from an FTP site in Brazil, <laughs> in the university. I did this and I sent it to everyone. Everyone wants it. We we all we we want to be heard. Yes, exactly right. Uh, I've received your uh, copy. Thank you very much. My, my assistant has said that. So from to, yeah, from this site in, in in Brazil. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't know where the where the site is. But if you if your library has electronic access, you don't need to pirate it. Springer is quite concerned with piracy, which is why they're trying to keep these things as cheap as possible. Uh, Nick Trefethen's book is available for free on his website, and Siam Publisher is okay with that. Which, which one is that? So approximation theory and approximation practice, all of the published files for for MATLAB are are there. So you have complete access to all his code, and and his and Siam Publisher is okay with that. I'm really happy with this. Okay, any other questions? And thank you for listening. <laughs>